1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verses 3 and 4 are my text this morning before we begin our study in the Proverbs. Uh, the context here is that certain false teachers have come into Corinth and have misled uh, the believers there. They have been uh, maybe former Pharisees or a sect of Pharisees that came in to dissuade the work that Paul had laid down at the Corinthian church. No one is really sure for certain. We do know that the Sadducees uh, denied the resurrection itself. So although uh, you have this new congregation and you have this new work among the Gentiles, you had error that had creeped in and Paul is now going to address that. Uh, for, or now, I make known to you the gospel which I declared or preached to you, which you all re also received and for which you stand. When I was a first year seminary student, uh, Dr. Johnson had been invited to attend a local church and they wanted for him to address an issue uh, that they had disagreed with his position on and they, uh, out of respect for him, wanted a full-throated uh, explanation for the things that he believed and taught. I was sitting on the front row as a young seminarian at the time and taking copious notes. I lost those notes somewhere in that 50-year period of time. Uh, and frankly, I couldn't even tell you the text that he referred to. What I do remember about that morning with Dr. Johnson was how kind and gracious he was to that congregation. I specifically remember him saying, I don't enjoy doing this, being invited here and telling you that I disagree with you or that you are in error about something. Uh, I remember that clearly what kind and gracious attitude he had. You remember the Proverbs talk about tone, and Dr. Johnson was a master of it. Always made you feel so comfortable and uplifted. Uh, now in the next few moments, may the spirit of S. Lewis Johnson just have a thimbleful of my heart and my mind. Paul begins in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 3 with an explanation of what he had preached or proclaimed. I think it's interesting we send missionaries out and they come back and they have their stories and they have their slides and pictures for us. Uh, to report back on the things that they did or saw. But the apostolic model is really the disciples going out and coming back and reporting what they taught. Here is an explanation of it. The Apostle Paul. Notice the word first. Think of that as a foundation, a first principle of what had been taught to the church at Corinth and declared by him. And that would be namely the death of Jesus Christ and his resurrection. Great facts of history going forward. Think of it as a foundation. Philosophically, we call that first principles or simply starting points. We make that very clear, meaning that nothing precedes them. 
They are the beginning of the argument or the instruction. First principles. And notice the words also. Very important in the text. That's two parties. Also received. So the apostle by using also, was like the Corinthians. Revelation was delivered to him as well. Galatians chapter 1 and verse 12, Paul declared to those believers that he did not receive his gospel from men, but from Jesus Christ himself, which qualified him for his apostleship. The apostle is one who saw, who heard, and was commissioned by the resurrected Jesus Christ Himself. So there are Paul's qualifications set forth. There are no apostles today. Um, anyone claiming that title certainly does not understand the uniqueness of that office or that calling. The word also tells us a second thing. Paul could speak with infallible certainty, and here it is. Christ died for our sins as a sacrifice, as a propitiation, as an offering. Propitiation, meaning full satisfaction. The hostility that a righteous and holy God would have toward man has now been propitiated. It has been quelled. Oil has been poured upon the water. And it is peaceful again. The apostle. There is now no condemnation for those of us in Christ Jesus. The operative word, in Christ Jesus. They are the representatives of the propitiation that God has given and granted to believers. So, the apostle says, you stand. That is the unequivocated belief that they had when he left Corinth the place from which they would not move. Their feet are in concrete. God in His grace has propitiated believers and they at Corinth are them. Now look at this closely. This phrase, according to the Scriptures. The fact that Messiah would die and was a propitiatory offering was from the Old Testament. It was predicted in the law and foretold by the prophets themselves. Our Lord rebuked His disciples for not knowing that in the law and what the prophets had foretold, written on the subject. That only includes the disciples. It was also true of the travelers on the Emmaus Road in Luke chapter 24. And I can hardly wait for Mark to expound that text because it's one of the great texts in all of Scripture. The 53rd chapter of Isaiah the prophet clearly has the foretelling of Messiah's death and his suffering and atonement. Paul goes on, verse 4, and he was buried, and that he rose again on the third day according to the Scriptures. More historic facts. They have never been disputed. They have stood the test of time. Now thousands, probably thousands now, through the Centuries, I assume, have tried to disprove the resurrection. Let's just go to the historic point in question. All one had to do is produce a body. 
He would be enormously made rich by the Romans, and he would be a man of great standing among the Sanhedrin and the Jews. No one with all of that could produce a body. It was resurrected. A historic fact that has stood the test of time. So here are the historic facts. The man, Jesus, fact, died. The man, Jesus, fact, was buried. And fact, on the third day, he bodily rose from the dead. Again, the, the refrain, notice, according to the Scriptures. Which point has been forcefully made by Peter on Solomon's portico on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. In summary, I read Peter's speech beginning in Acts chapter 2 and verse 24. He writes, I tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried and his tomb is here to this day. But David was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of Messiah, that he would not be abandoned to the grave, nor did his body see decay, but God raised this man Jesus to life. And we, said the apostle, are all witnesses to it. That's a fact. No one was in dispute. Our text, 1 Corinthians 15, drew our attention to the two refrains. They are the foundation of Paul's argument, according to the Scriptures, the self-authenticating Scriptures. They provide the authority for what the Apostle Paul preached and has written to us. What I find striking about that is that the Apostle does not appeal to his apostleship which he very forcefully does in Galatians chapter 1. He doesn't say that now as an apostle, I charge you to remember the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He doesn't say that. Nor does he appeal to his own personal revelation that he had received. He certainly did that before King Agrippa in Acts chapter 26. His testimony, this is what happened to me. But he doesn't do that. Not here. No, his appeal is to the authority regarding the revelation of the Scriptures themselves about the man Jesus and the resurrection. Now, I bring all of this to your attention because one of the graduates of the seminary in which I hold a degree and has had a major, major influence upon Believer's Chapel down through the decades has used some rather unfortunate language. I say unfortunate because I am giving him the benefit of the doubt. Here are his words, and I quote them. We must tether the faith of this and the next generation to the resurrection, rather than the inspiration, infallibility, and authority of the Bible. I read it again. We must tether the faith of this and the next generation to the resurrection rather than the 
inspiration, infallibility, and authority of the Bible. Now, why did I choose this text to talk to you this morning? Because as you can see, the apostle argued just the opposite of that. He says, not once, but twice, according to the scriptures. Our authority is either in them or, my friends, our authority is in ourselves. Thus, we determine what the text is. And now we have fallen into the wheelhouse of the liberals. Rudolf Bultmann, Emil Bruner. You alone are the determiner of the text what it says, what its authority is. Does it appeal to you or not? Our first principle must be, always must be, what the Princeton professors of 1880 to 1920 called verbal plenary inspiration. Let me give that to you in detail. Verbal, every word, every word formed, and every word in its placement in the text only found that way in the original text. The first manuscript authored by the writer. Now, we don't have that original text today. What we do have are thousands upon thousands upon thousands of copies. And through the science, it is a discipline unto itself of textual criticism. We have had at Believer's Chapel Dr. Dan Wallace. He is one of the great textual critics today. We take the thousands and thousands of documents and we place them in order. And the order has to do with the time where this particular text came from, its circulation, and so forth. And then we go from that to narrowing down the exact language of a sentence or even a word. Here's what you need to know about that. Without equivocation, there is no dispute in any Christian doctrine regarding a textual criticism, whether one word was used in the place of another. No doctrine in dispute. Here's the second word. Verbal, now plenary, meaning full or complete. All parts of the Bible are equally divine and equally sacred. So all words of Holy Scripture we call holy, plain and simple, and thus equally authoritative and useful for teaching, for correction, for doctrine. The apostle taught the full counsel of God, and the full counsel is found in the authoritative plenary Scriptures. And here's the last word, inspiration. Verbal plenary inspiration. And as Warren began so appropriately this morning, God-breathed Word. That is it. That's inspiration. God breathed out the words Himself supernaturally. Now, let's think about those components. God breathed out the Word, but it is supernaturally transmitted through the writer of the text, guiding him exactly, guiding him precisely. What God would have us to know, 
what God would say to us. Now, how did that take place? Well, the writers didn't go into a trance or a dream. They just wrote as individuals using their background, their life experience, and their education. Thus, David often uses terms of a shepherd because he was a shepherd. He uses terms of warfare and warrior because he was one. And he uses terms of a king and a throne room because he sat on a throne and he frequented his throne room. So verbal plenary inspiration, that's our foundation. That's our starting point. Without knowing and believing that, the, the question of foundation is left solely to interpretation. Who is the interpreter? Is the resurrection of Jesus Christ, is that defined for us by the unbeliever Paul Tillich? He certainly has a view of the resurrection. Paul Tillich would not be allowed to stand behind a lectern or a pulpit in this church. The Apostle Paul says, according to the Scriptures, that's his first principle. That's his starting point. Now, the logician using Aristotelian logic would now raise his hand and interrupt me. And his criticism would be simply this, that you are spending all your time reasoning in a circle. You are assuming what you're trying to prove. But he's dead wrong. You see, I'm not trying to prove anything. I'm merely expounding the claim of what the Scriptures say of themselves. They say of themselves that they are the undisputed authority, the first principle, the foundation. They say of themselves that and it speaks to their own veracity. I spend no time nor any concern trying to prove them. Regarding these comments from the Dallas Theological Seminary, one man tweeted out this week, this matter can all be cleaned up and cleared up in one Sunday school class. Well, I don't see it that way at all. Without imputing motives, why someone, some instructor, and some institution would put something like this online for viewership, for people to hear across not only the country, but the world, that's none of my business. My business is simply here to seize the opportunity that has been set forth as a result. This is just one text this morning. There are many, many, many more to expound. I leave that to the brighter minds and the better voices of Believer's Chapel. My hope would be that no one, none of us, would have any doubt or question regarding the inspiration, the authority of the Bible. It is certain and reliable for our faith, for our practice, and for our spiritual lives day to day. You see, Simply put, it is not enough to say, I believe in the resurrection. What a resurrection is that that you're talking about? 
It's not enough to say, I believe in Jesus. What Jesus exactly is that? There's only one answer. And it's been the answer that has been echoed through the rooms of Believer's Chapel since its inception. And that is, it is the resurrection of Jesus Christ, His person, according to the Scriptures. You stay there. You don't move off that point. You have the high ground. The Bible has given you its self-authentication. You have won the day, and you have won the argument, the dispute, the controversy, whatever it would be. I didn't want to do this. I've got a book of Proverbs to teach, but I felt compelled because of so many reaching out to me for a comment. So there you have it.